I am Lieutenant General Odonov, and you listen to Ukraine's the latest. I'm Roland Oliphant. Today we bring you the latest news from Ukraine as Volodymyr Zelensky says Donald Trump can't solve the problem of the Ukraine war and fresh sanctions are imposed on Russia. We'll also have an exclusive interview with Ukraine's spy chief General Budanov and James Rothwell talks about his conversation with the head of the German army. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody is going to break us. We are strong. We are Ukrainians. Every weekday, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Friday, the 23rd of February, 2024. One year and 363 days since the full-scale invasion began. Today I'm joined by James Rothwell and a team in Kiev, Dominic Nichols and David Knowles. I started with the latest military updates from Ukraine. Three people have been killed in a drone strike in Kiev, hit Russian drone, also hit a commercial area in Ukraine's Black Sea port of Odessa, killing three people, according to the Ukrainian military. The drone count overnight is 31 Russian drones launched, air defences destroying 23, according to the Ukrainian military. Firefighters said they recovered one body and said people may still be under the rubble in Odessa. The bodies of two more people were found under the rubble, said Ola Kipa, the regional governor. In total, three people died as a result of the enemy attack. Looking at the issue of the grain blockade on the Polish border, this ongoing dispute about whether Polish farmers want to let Ukrainian grain into the country. Police in Poland say they're investigating an incident where a load of rapeseed uh, was spilled from train trucks carrying the cargo from Ukraine near the Dorohusk border crossing with Poland. Alexander Kubrakov, the deputy prime minister of Ukraine, said the loaders are damaged by unidentified people, called for those responsible to be held accountable. A press officer for the police in Chelm in Poland told Reuters that officers were told that grain had been spilled from grain trucks near the station and that they were investigating. And the context, is, of course, is that farmers, not just in Poland, actually, but Poland's really got the focus because it neighbours Ukraine, have been demonstrating against what they say is unfair competition from Ukrainian grain being allowed to enter the European Union. Meanwhile, India has confirmed that the Russian army is signing up some of its citizens. India's foreign ministry confirmed that some of the country's citizens have signed up for support jobs in the Russian army and was working with Moscow to secure their discharge. This is from the Hindu newspaper, which reported that 18 Indians are stranded in various border towns along the front lines of Russia's war in Ukraine. At least three had been forced to fight alongside the Russians. There's no confirmation of whether or not those individuals have been forced to take on combat roles. I've got one very short update. The United States has announced more than 500 new sanctions against Russia over the invasion of Ukraine and the death of Alexei Navalny. It targets people connected to Navalny's imprisonment and the war machine. Also, export restrictions of more than 100 firms or individuals. With that, I'm going to bring in James who I hope is joining us from Berlin, who's been having a fairly interesting discussion with senior German officers. James, are you there? Hello, good afternoon, Roland. Can you hear me? I can, loud and clear. James, you have been speaking to the none other than the head of the German Armed Forces, which is someone who's had a lot to say and knows an awful lot about NATO's preparations and NATO's role in, in dealing with this war and a possible fallout. Can you just tell us what he said? I can. But this was a very interesting interview because over the years, traditionally, the head of the German armed forces would not often give interviews to the German media, let alone the foreign media. And I think the fact that the head of the German army is engaging at that level suggests that a big change is underway in German society, in the military. And it shows a shift where they are much more eager, I think, than they were in recent years to put their position forward. Now, the sort of headline takeaway from this interview was that the head of the German army is very confident that if there were to be a Russian attack or even a Russian invasion on the eastern flank into the Baltic states, he is confident that those troops would be repelled by NATO. That's not just uh, Estonian or Latvian or Lithuanian troops, but also German troops who are, as part of NATO are stationed on that flank. Now, I think that's 
I think that's an interesting response from him. When I put the question to the general, I wasn't, I'll be honest, completely sure whether he was going to answer as confidently as that, considering all the criticism that we've seen over the years about the allegedly poor state of preparation of the German army. Boris Pistorius, the defence minister, and this general, of course, have really stepped up efforts recently to make the German army Kriegsstuchtig, which is German for war ready. So an interesting response from him there, bullish, confident, exactly, you might say, the kind of response that other NATO leaders expect from Germany at a time like this. We also touched on the nuclear issue. I asked whether he feared that Putin may resort at a later stage of the Ukraine war to using nuclear weapons and, as it were, opening that Pandora's box of putting nuclear weapons into the battlefield for the first time since the 1940s. He said he did not anticipate that Putin would resort to doing this due to what he described as the unforeseen consequences, no doubt alluding to the warning that we know was passed to Putin by the West, of which we do not know the details in terms of terrible consequences. We don't know what exactly that would occur if such a strike were to happen. And the other main ingredient of this interview was a question about British military cooperation. I did ask if there was anything in particular that the British army needed to do more of in order to support Ukraine, in order to support Germany. He wouldn't be drawn on that issue, but he did rather nimbly slip into a speech by Field Marshal Montgomery, which was delivered in Cairo to his troops in 1942, where he spoke to the troops and said, we don't know each other, but we must have confidence in each other. And having confidence in each other was his message to, and a warm message really, to his counterparts in the British military. So I, those were the, if you like, the three main takeaways of the interview. Interesting to hear a, a, a German general quoting Montgomery. I suppose the main thing, James, here is that America's role in NATO is now frankly under question, right? And Germany's always been looked to or is currently looked to as the potential economic, but also a major military power in Europe, alongside Britain, although we're not no longer in the European Union. But they faced a lot of a huge amount of of criticism for just not being up for it and not being ready. Do you get a sense that, you know, behind these bullish statements of his, there is some a genuine shift in the German stance? He talked about the transitioning to a battle ready organization or I don't know, do you suspect from your interactions with him that, that there's a lot of talk, but the, is there substance behind it? I'd be interested in your take on that. Absolutely. I think at the moment it's a question of taking the German army at face value and seeing whether the proof is in the pudding. For example, in this interview, the general did say that he wanted Germany to be a major security power in Europe in terms of public messaging. That undoubtedly is a shift from Germany's position pre uh, invasion of Ukraine and even some of the sentiment coming from Chancellor Olaf Scholz post-Russian invasion. As we all know, there is this ongoing row about the provision of Taurus missiles, which Mr. Scholz is very reluctant still to deliver. And I think the, perhaps the best way to characterise this sort of dilemma for the Germans at the moment is that it's true that they face a lot of criticism, an avalanche of criticism, really, about why they're not providing the tourist missiles or in the past why they're not providing the tanks or the other pieces of equipment. But the German officials in general do tend to bristle at the suggestion that they're not playing a fair paying their fair share or playing a big part in this war. They will point out that they send absolutely masses of money to Ukraine in financial terms. And Olaf Scholz, I think, really views the money as Germany's primary way of supporting Ukraine. And I think, frankly, they would rather lean on the United Kingdom and the United States to do the main muscle in terms of arms production, and then they would follow their lead. This is what Mr. Schultz talks about when he mentions the lockstep principle in terms of the provision of aid. I think we will have to see the game that's been played in the past, as you know, on specific weapons deliveries from Germany is that Mr. Schultz will say nine, nine, nine. And then finally, there will be a very reluctant ya, uh, only perhaps after he's faced an overwhelming amount of pressure domestically and from his allies. And the German military ultimately gets instructions from Mr. Schultz and has to follow them because he is the chancellor. Nevertheless, what the general has said in this interview, I, I think shows a quite sincere willingness 
to become a big, important power in European security. And finally, you mentioned Mr. Trump there. The, the Germans say, whoever is in power in Germany, we will work with them. But behind the scenes, and this certainly came through at Munich Security Conference, where I was last week, I sent some jitters, I sent some concerns that if Mr. Trump were to become president and he basically did not, did not prove to be, shall we say, a reliable security partner on NATO. The Germans know they will be expected to step forward. And I think there's a little bit of nervousness about that. Got it. James, just before we go to the chaps in, in Kiev, um, President Zelensky has been speaking to Fox News. Have you been keeping an eye on that? Are you able to update on, on, on the remarks that came out of there? Yes, there's two points to make about Zelensky's interview with Fox News. The first thing that Zelensky said is that he cannot understand how Trump would end the war in 24 hours, referring to some of Mr. Trump's rather perhaps bullish, overconfident even, remarks about his ability to solve the problem. Mr. Zelensky said he can't solve the problem. This tragedy is with me. And he also reiterated his call for Mr. Trump, if he becomes president, to go to the Ukrainian front line with Zelensky at some point in the future. Now, based on Mr. Trump's remarks about NATO and Zelensky personally and Ukraine recently, it, it seems like a fairly unlikely prospect that he might go to the Ukrainian front line as the next president, if it happens, though we never know. And then the second point to make about the Fox News interview is that Mr. Zelensky was very, very unhappy with Tucker Carlson's interview with Vladimir Putin, unsurprisingly. He called it two hours of, discretion might be the better part of valor on this one, so I will say he described Tucker Carlson's interview with Vladimir Putin as two hours of bull S star, star, star. He was very unhappy with it. He says, I don't have time to hear more than two hours of bull blank about us, about the world, about the United States, about our relations and this interview with a killer, suggesting that he was not just unhappy with the interview, President Zelensky, but he has nothing but content for it. And many of the people who sat through all two hours of that interview and the history lesson that was offered up by Mr. Putin may well be inclined to sympathise with the president on that. Thank you very much, James. There's just a couple more updates from the news that I just want to squeeze in before we turn to Kia. One rather sad bit of news that's in the paper today. At least one in 14 Ukrainian refugees in Britain has become homeless since June 2022 after relations with sponsor families broke down or ended. This is news that around 6,040 Ukrainian households with at least one dependent child, so that's equivalent to about 12,000 people, and a further 3,000 single Ukrainians had sought homelessness support from councils by the end of last month. About 15,000 Ukrainians were forced to find alternative accommodation after being made homeless. And this represents about 7.5% of about 200,000 who came over on the, the Homes for Ukraine scheme. Charles Hymas has written more about this on the Telegraph website. I would encourage you to go over and read. Not the coziest of news, I'm afraid. And without further more ado, um, I would like to turn over to Kiev um, and to find which of our illustrious podcast team is out there to talk to us. Dom, David, are you there? Hi, Roland. Yeah, we're just calling in from Kiev. I know Dom is on the line as well. Dom. Yep, I'm here. Happy to go after you, David. Yeah, sure thing. Well, we've had a very busy couple of days here. This morning was really fascinating. We travelled up the Dnipro River, away north of Kiev, to a small village called Stary Petrivsky, and we'd been invited by a contact and a friend, Alla, who's a teacher at the lycée there at the school, and we spent the morning looking around the school, talking to the pupils, talking to quite a few of the teachers, including the head teacher Olga, who were really frank and honest about some of the challenges they're facing. But we also saw really a lot of really moving and positive news, I think, especially from the kids who were incredibly keen to practice their English with me. And they have a podcast studio, they've built their own little podcast studio. It was previously a sort of mock a traditional Ukrainian house. So you go in and there's an embroidered portrait of Taras Shevchenko, the, the famous poet and artist. There's sort of Ukrainian uh, Vishyankas uh, hanging about. There's lots of artwork and there's a spinning wheel. There's all sorts of things. And in the middle of that, they put a table and two microphones. So part of the morning was spent them quizzing me about what we do on this podcast and what we found when we come to Ukraine. And it was a really lovely experience. And I must say, for 13-year-olds, their English was absolutely outstanding. It was really, really great meeting the kids. And we, we spoke to a lots of them. We spoke to, as I said, their teachers, just to get a sense of 
what being at school, what being at high school, elementary school is like nearly two years into the full scale invasion. They told us that that school hadn't been occupied, but there's a school up the road, which was. The Russians got very, very in the opening weeks of the invasion. And Olga, their teacher, was talking to us about some of the decisions they had to make when it came to wondering whether to bring the children back. They spoke about how obviously quite a lot of the kids went abroad and how they're trying to, they're desperately trying to support them and the decisions the families there have to make. Like if you're, they told us about one Ukrainian kid who'd gone to Germany and the teachers here were still sending him, essentially sending him homework and helping him with his English because they said, look, in German school, they're not, he's not learning English, but we want him to. And the, the difficulty really of some kids deciding to stay away, their families deciding to stay away. They also spoke about, obviously, the fact that for many of the children there, lots of their family will be in the military. Several have been killed. And the psychological stress and toll that takes on the children and how the teachers have to support them. And they were really keen to talk about their work with mental health, encouraging the children to really do things that they enjoyed. I mean, we were chatting to them and they were telling, I was learning a lot about youth culture. I'll tell you that, Roland. They're, they're playing a Chinese game called Genshin on their phones. There were several dancers who enjoyed modern dance. Quite a few gamers, people who want to go into IT. And they were speaking about that and about how they were trying to find methods and try and find ways of dealing with their own anxiety. And I was incredibly impressed by the openness of the teachers and the students actually with each other about how they spoke about these things. We interviewed, as I said, the head teacher and it's, it was a really difficult conversation for her, I think. Quite, a lot, quite often her eyes were filling with tears as she spoke about her children going through really awful things. I mean, she spoke about the huge rise in uh, anxiety in the kids and the problems problems they have at home. There's been a they, they they think they've seen a rise in things like alcoholism and you know, to some extent domestic violence. Often often with absent parents that makes everything worse. And the school at the centre of the Hamada is really this, one of the focal points of the community. And it's difficult, I think, for the teachers. It's, now this is my commentary, I think to suddenly find themselves in, in, in a role where they're almost expected to, to be social workers as well and working with the social services a lot closer on a lot more cases. And they were telling me things like previously, obviously children, like all children, thought very negatively of weapons. But now because to a large extent society has become quite militarised, for some kids they see weapons as a good thing, right? Like it, it, weapons are good because it helps protect you against things that might want to hurt you. So they said they're seeing a rise of children bringing in knives to school and that they're going to have to install a scanner at the entrance to try and detect that. There's also a policewoman on duty, which they didn't used to have because one of the issues they've seen over the past two years is how the shelter in the school, and Roland, I'm sure many listeners will will know this, in the old Soviet schools they have really extensive shelters beneath them. It's what I saw in Butcher as well. Don't think of just one basement area. There's a proper warren of connected classrooms, of there's a place for the children to eat, all that kind of thing. It takes 10 minutes it's 15 minutes to walk around it and see it and they were saying one of the issues is that shelter is used by the whole community so you've got people coming into the school who are not linked to the school and they're trying to sort out that and think about how they regulate that so it's from a british perspective it's quite interesting because of course in, in our primary schools and high schools, safeguarding is a really really massive thing and th- i'm not saying it's not something that the ukrainians are thinking about at all but it's they're having to approach it in a very different way when think when the school becomes a real center point of the community when it comes to things like airstrikes olga the principal was telling us how awful it was and how awful it was that she knows that the kids now can differentiate between sounds right like they can tell what out, outgoing defensive anti-aircraft fire anti, anti-missile anti-drone fire sounds like but they can also hear what incoming russian missile drones sound like and she's talking about how sad that is for children that age you're talking anything from six years old five years old to 14 15 of the fact that they have that knowledge and in her view they're really growing up far too quickly but the kids themselves were an absolute delight we spoke to vladik and dasha and yana um who as i said put me through my paces really with some quite sharp questioning and they were very keen to show us their school it's it's a riot of color there are all sorts of posters and artwork all over the wall they took us through the shelter and it's very impressive some of the classrooms really have all sorts of learning materials and and learning aids and i was looking at some of the blackboards and one of them had a load of algebra which they informed me was good for about maybe 12 years old honestly roland i couldn't make head or tail of it the next blackboard was a load of english lessons that they were studying and it was very very impressive advanced stuff i thought but it was yeah it was just a pleasure to meet them really and see how they're doing and see how they're dealing with I mean, one of the themes I think we've picked up on this week has been 
that the, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons Ukrainians are so tired is there's no obvious end to this war in the future. So what does that mean if you're a child, if you're going to school, if you're studying? Please do ask me questions, but one of the things I noticed, and maybe you'd want to ask me about this because it's quite interesting, is how one of the teachers told us that what she's saying is how many of the kids are now talking about in the future I want to be in the military. We met one guy called uh, Nazir who is very keen to be a pilot. He's a wrestling champion. I think he's about 13, 14 years old. He's a wrestling champion for his age, but he wants to go into the military. We And the teachers say it's something they notice is it's now a, it's now a popular thing for many of the kids to think about. Thanks, David. That's actually a really interesting point. These are teenagers you're talking to, right? So in a few years, they'll turn 18 and they're Technically, you're not actually eligible for the draft in Ukraine or for, for the mobilization until you're 27. I think the new law is to lower it to 25, and that was connected with whether or not you would have done your national service and so on. So it's possible they will turn 18 and not necessarily be straight away hauled off to the army. But especially for the male students, that must be something that that they're facing and having to deal with. Are you going to go? And we know for a fact, right, that people... Not everybody wants to go and fight, and some people try to evade it. Was that a discussion that they had or that they mentioned, that that prospect looming over them in a few years? So it was interesting because this is what the teachers told us. I did ask them all, every kid we met, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? And to be honest, the majority of the answers I got, Najee was the only guy who said, yeah, I want to be a pilot. That's what I want to do. The others were fair, fairly, you know, what you might expect from a bunch of 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds. I think there's one person who wants to be a blogger. One, uh, Artem, told us he wanted to go to America and be and get really rich and through YouTube and was quizzing us for tips on how to do that and uh, wants to stream online games and so on. There was a mix of stuff, I think. We did ask them as well about... As, as I said, like the schools are one of the focal points of the community. So there is a section in this school, and this is something I saw in Butcher as well, where the community will come and the students will go and they'll do things like knit camouflage nets and they'll sort out things for the troops. They'll draw pictures that will be sent to the front lines and the soldiers will put them up in their dugouts, that kind of thing. Or they'll pack a tin of candles and warm socks. And they were the kids were very proud of telling us about what they were doing, how they were playing their part. What was quite interesting was... On the first floor, there's what was described to me, and I think it's through translation, as the museum. So at one end, it's quite a long, open corridor. And you've got to think the sort of classroom's going off this, and there are kids racing past when the bell goes. There, and at one end is a cabinet, several cabinets full of essentially relics from the Second World War. So you've got little bomblets. I think there's some mortar bombs. There were quite a few spent shell casings. There was somebody's... There was, somebody's uniform, there was quite a few press clippings in a cabinet sort of describing the liberation of this area of, of Stary Petrovsky uh, by the Red Army, and it's a sort of little history corner, the sort of the corner for understanding what happened to this place back in the Second World War. But the majority of this open corridor, this open museum, is dedicated to this war, and there were lots of really interesting things there and we did quiz the teachers about this the kind of militarization you've got letters written by the soldiers back to the school thanking them for sending them stuff for supporting them you had i sent a picture of this to dom actually because i half recognized it but didn't know what it was and it was the sort of the empty vessel once it's been used of an anti-tank missile yeah it's a stugner anti-tank missile or the tube afterwards so yeah the missile would have come out of that so that well hopefully it was empty you'll be able to tell me but yeah it was a stugner anti-tank shoulder launched anti-tank missile Exactly that. So imagine you're in a school where there's five and six year olds running about up to 13, 14, 15. There's one of those things just in the corridor next to a big um, frieze of the Ukrainian flag and silhouettes of soldiers in the Second World War. And all around this is other things. And I did ask the head teacher about this because I sort of saw that and thought, bloody hell, you've got that in the school. What's, can you tell us about that? And she gave, a, I thought, a really interesting answer. She talked about how, look, we don't want to traumatize the children, but it's something we can't ignore. So we're not choosing things, we're not choosing to display things that might traumatize them, like the sort of the, the actual guns, that sort of thing. Because as Dom said, like, it's a spent, it's an empty casing. It's just, and I should say as well, it's been covered in in messages of saying thanks to our troops, thanks for, for protecting us, that sort of thing. And she said, look, we can't ignore it. It's part of their lives. We do a lot and we want to thank them. And we just try and make sure, you know, she was like, look, we have displaced kids here from Mariupol and from other bits of, you know, of, of occupied Ukraine. And we just got to make sure that we reflect their experience in a way that, and it's clearly walking a line, I think. It was very interesting and really quite moving seeing that and seeing how the teachers are dealing with that, how to 
how they're dealing with as everything I mentioned before, right? The rise in disruptive behaviour, the fact that many of the, these poor kids' home lives are not going as well because of the war, and the fact that they, they almost were under occupation at the beginning, and that and they are involved as part of the Haramada, as part of the local community. They are involved making stuff and doing stuff for the troops. So her point was like, look, you can't ignore it, so we've got to approach it in a healthy way. So yeah, it was a really interesting experience, and thank you very much, Dom, for responding when I sent you the, the picture, because I saw it and thought, gosh, what's that? Then I realised, of course, we've got Dom Nichols with us, where I can send him a picture of something and he can tell us, and that's exactly what it was. So that's where we've been this morning. We had lunch with the kids. We had a lovely, it was lovely fish and mashed potato and we had a pickled uh, tomato, pickled tomato with that as well. It was great. And uh, what we're going to do, just to be clear, we were doing lots of recordings, talking to the kids about their experience. We'll turn that into a special documentary with our wonderful producer, Adley Pushman ponte And that will come out in the next few weeks, months, once we've sorted through all the footage by thought and all the recordings. I, but I thought I'd come on and tell you a little bit about the experience this morning as we've been through it. Brilliant. David, thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating stuff, actually. An aspect of life we don't often hear about. So thank you very much for that. Turning now to the Dom Nichols. Dom, you've been having some somewhat more cloak and dagger adventures, I understand, um, around Kiev, which sound pretty fascinating. So could you tell us, I think actually anyone who looks at our website should already know who you've been interviewing, to be honest. Have you been up to? Tell us all about it, please. Yeah, so I've been dancing around for quite some weeks trying to inch closer to General Kirill Badanov, the head of Ukraine's military intelligence department here. And it worked, but it bore fruit. I was then approached through secure messaging apps by a number of people and handed from one to the other. And then I was told to get to a certain a certain pin. I was sent a, a, a pin on sort of Google Maps and I sort of had to make my own way there. And I went over with Francis and Jack Leather, our videographer. So we went over there to this very sketchy part of town, something out of the start of the Sopranos. There's burnt out cars, there's destroyed buildings, graffiti everywhere. It looked really rough. We we're just standing there on the street and then this woman in civilian clothes approached us and checked our IDs and what have you. We were driven into this to this base where we went and met Mr. Badanov. Um, and that was quite a quite an extraordinary encounter. We're waiting in his outer offices. It's all dark. He doesn't like the lights being on. Fair enough. But also all the windows are sandbagged up to at least head height. So there's no natural light. It's all very dark and quite mysterious. And I thought, right, I better break the ice here. I better try to reach out. He's got a canary in the cage in a cage, a live canary. So I said, oh, it's a, you know, is this the metaphor? Is this like a military intelligence? Is the canary in the coal mine warning of future threats to the country? And the aide that I was trying to impress, he just turned around and went, no, if the canary dies, we know we've been hit by a Russian gas attack. <laughs> okay, sorry. But anyway, we eventually went in, had the interview with Mr. Mr. Badanov through an interpreter. So it's a bit clunky. It's very, it's difficult working through an interpreter because when I get his answer, if there's something I want to go, oh, leap in on that thing he's just said, I can't do it because it's, he's not said it, it's the interpreter and it all just, it will break down if you try and do that. So I listen back to that interview and I think, oh, I could have asked so many other questions, but I think it is entirely workable. It's a very interesting interview. And of course, working through an interpreter, the polite thing to do, of course, I'm speaking to Mr. Badanov, I'm not speaking to the interpreter, so I'm staring at him. I'm looking at him in the eye and I'm asking him questions, even though the voice is coming from my left shoulder from the, the chap sat next to me. But for long periods of time, when the interpreter is translating my words to Ukrainian and Ukrainian back to English, Kirill Badanov and I just staring into each other's eyes. It was really quite quite off-putting at one point because he's the Prince of Darkness and he's just staring into his eyes. It was rather, it felt a bit like a staring competition after a while. And I thought, well, maybe I should break his gaze so it's not so awkward. And then I thought, well, hang on. He might be in mid-sentence or the interpreter in mid-sentence and, and the guy thinks I'm just bored and looking around the room. So I can't do that. So I'm just staring down the barrel of his eyes. Anyway, that's by the by. It's quite central, actually. He then, of course, he was famous for the all the videos in the run-up to the counteroffensive last year about not talking too much about it and not giving away secrets. Remember all those videos with all the all soldiers and pilots and what have you all putting their fingers to their lips and going, shh, you know, don't talk about it. And he was the sort of, he was the face of that shush campaign. So at the end, when we were doing photos and having just saying cheerio, I was lining up, I was stood next to him as Jack was take, taking pics. And I said, can we do the shush thing? Can we do the shush, you know, the, you know, the shush thing? And he just went, he looked at me and went, no. <laughs> right, okay, fair enough. That's Dombles handed his ass on a plate. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Badanov. But yeah, fascinating interview. That's coming out later today on the podcast, but you'll see the, a slightly shortened version. Now the film of it is on our website. So that was a couple of days ago, and then today I've just been I've been meeting up with some military contacts here. I went round the Park of Eternal Glory here in in Kiev, where there's the Eternal Flame, and I went to see the Motherland 
monument, the symbol of Kyiv, the 102 meter monument to the glory of Ukraine. That was fascinating. I went on the metro, haven't been on the Ukrainian metro before, been on the Moscow metro, but first time here. It is deep underground and it's also acts as a nuclear bomb shelter. So there's two for the line I was on, you've got to go down two huge escalators and through nuclear blast doors because back in the bad old days, that was where the population were going to hide in the event of a nuclear exchange and these doors were going to shut them. And that was going to be it. But they so they are deep, deep, deep underground, partly because Kiev is a very hilly city. But these lines, the escalators, they go deep. Yeah, deeper, deeper than Francis Durnley's pockets uh, to last orders. I mean, they go right, the, right the way down. So that was this morning. Just want to say thank you to uh, for the week's help, actually, to Objective Ukraine, the business risk management consultancy that's been helping us out here or helping me out. Good connections there. And uh, so a few other bits and bobs later on today. But that's my update, Roland. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We're not quite out of time, so I want to ask you a bit more about... You've touched on it with Budanov, and you've touched on the difficulty of working through translators, which is something I think all of us who do foreign news are familiar with. It's tricky, but he's also... I mean, he's notoriously difficult to interview. I think you've kind of mentioned this, this you know, this steely eye, this monosyllabus. I mean, how he's meant to be, he's monosyllabic, won't be drawn on things. He will speak in hints and aphorisms without giving stuff. I know, as, a, as an interviewee, if we strip away the difficulties with the translator and stuff, how tricky was he? Well, I mean, he didn't make me feel unwelcome at all. He was very well, his team were terrific. There was none of that. I was told that he wanted to work through a translator because he could speak an element of English, but I was told he's a bit shy. And I thought, this guy ain't shy. He's definitely not, that's not him. He may be many things, but he ain't shy. And I could tell. So when I'm talking to him, of course, I remember I'm staring him in the eye. I'm asking my question and there's a sort of micro twitch at the corner of his mouth. So I know that he can hear what I'm saying. He's understanding what I'm saying before the interpreter has got hold of it and passed it on. So, yeah, this guy knows what he's doing. He was fine. He's the head of military intelligence. He's not going to tell me anything particularly secret. I asked a couple of things and he said, look, you're straying into classified areas. So I, I know I'm a journalist. That's what I'm supposed to do. What do you want? He was very genuine i think otherwise when he didn't want to talk about something he just blathered on about something else totally nonsensically but he didn't stop the question i suppose he couldn't do because he was going through a translator but there was no awkwardness they were very generous with us they didn't usher us out afterwards so we could we could go and take a load of pickies around the gaff but yeah he's a fairly cool character which i think is important as well as uh, as well as his professional acumen in the trade craft of handling intelligence or gathering information and then analysing that to turn that into intelligence. There is, as we all remember, no such thing as information intelligence. There's information, then there's assessment, then there's intelligence. The phrase intelligence information is like nails down a chalkboard to my ears. But anyway, he knows what he's doing technically with his trade, clearly. But also there's this image he's cultivating very well as this cool, calm, collected, dark arts, prince of darkness, throat slitter, extraordinaire. I mean, he's got an SF background. He's special forces background. He fought in the East 10 years ago. He's been down in Crimea. He's been wounded multiple times. He survived 10 known assassination attempts. and I you don't know how many others. So the guy's been around the blocks a few times. So yes, it is important. Symbology is important just as much as President Zelensky is held up as a figure and that has its own morale boosting aspect for the public or so to uh, Karalo Badanov, that image of him. But he did generally seem quite a cool champ. He's quite tall, towering down on us. But yeah, we did get the occasional smirk, but I don't I don't know if that's because he's just seen something dark in my future or if it's just the way he is. But yeah, generally welcoming, but there were elements when the he's like someone someone left a window open. It's something got very cold in here. But the colour of being there with the canary and he's got his pet frog in a case in his office and there's a cat there as well. The cat was called Gunter. I asked if the canary had a name as well. And he's like, no. And I thought, oh, oh yeah, of course, because the you don't bond with the canary. That's there to die. That's it's a member of staff. It's not actually you're not gonna it's not a nice thing to have around the office. It's got a it's got a purpose. And the purpose is to sniff for a gas attack. So the so the colour was more than anything. It is a I'm not obviously not gonna say where it was in Kiev, but it's a it's a funny place to get to it's like I say, part part Sopranos, part James Bond getting in and out of the gaff. But no, well worth the entry price if you're ever if you're ever invited. Brilliant. Thank you, Dom, so much for that. Absolutely fascinating. Gentlemen, I think we've come to our final thoughts. James, could I go to you first for your final thoughts today, please? Yes, thanks, Roland. What a fascinating 
pair of interviews there, particularly with the spy chief. It really brought me into the room. I think that from my side, in terms of Germany, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on future statements coming out from the top of the German army and seeing whether there might be some possibly some movement from Schultz and top German military officials on the Taurus. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that at the moment, we've got a German army chief talking pretty tough about the idea of becoming a major security partner in Europe, but that's not necessarily been borne out by the facts yet. And I think we will have to see where that goes. So that for me is one to keep an eye out on in the context of the Germany part of the wider Ukraine, Russia, Europe story, and we'll see where it leads. Dom or, or, or David, do we have any final thoughts from Kiev? We'd like to have some final thoughts from Kiev, please. So one of you better speak up. Yeah, well, yeah, we're not done yet, Roland. We've got uh, <laughs> a lot more exciting stuff to, to come. But so as I said, when I was visiting the Flame of the Eternal Soldier earlier on today, there's a lot of military kit there. There's a, there's some in the centre of Kiev. There's a lot more kit military equipment out there in the around the east around the botanical gardens and the motherland statue 102 meters um and it's really interesting a bit like david was saying they've got the that tube in the school just to show people that this is real so this other military stuff is lying around to, to have a look at and you can touch it and you just see think about the physics that's that, that have been that those things have been exposed to when you've got metal peeled back and totally smashed up in the interior. It is quite extraordinary to see what's happening here and what is continuing to happen. But there's no denying that this is a very, very dangerous time, I think, for Ukraine. There is, I would characterise it as stagnation, really. The military is starved of ammunition, partly because of Congress, but also elsewhere. But it's it, beyond ammunition, and I'm going to take this up with some military figures I'm seeing later on today, the dearth of training is a biggie. Four weeks from a civilian off the street to, to potentially being on the front line. Four weeks training. That is nothing. And that is, so in the British military, you have 10 or 11 weeks just for your basic training. And then you go on to, to do your what's called special to arm after that. So that the paucity of training, the paucity of equipment in training yeah, is very stark. So there's a lot more that can be supply to Ukraine here other than just ammunition. That's getting the attention at the moment with Congress mainly, but there's a lot more that can be offered here and a lot more that has to be offered. They've basically got to build a new military from the ground up and it's a huge ask and I'm going to be pressing some people on that. So more to say on that, but it's a big old challenge, but lots of lots of thoughts here from Keith. Thank you, Dom. And David Knowles, would you like the very final word? Thank you very much, Roland. Just to add several things, just to add to what Dom said there, hearing a lot of the same things, a lot of questions about things like training, as Dom said, the dearth of equipment, the dearth of time, that's a big thing. I was chatting to a friend of mine who I've known for several years now, who told me that her dad, who's in his, I think he's in his late 50s, early 60s, has, he's not been called up, but he's been asked to register. Uh, and I think he had some, I think, Soviet army passed as well, and he's been asked to register. And if, if we're getting to that point, that's not a good thing. And they're ex the family are, ex understandably, extremely worried, trying to think of what part of the army he might go into if he does get called up, how he might be useful, but equally not in danger, particularly. I mean, what nobody wants here is, let's just take Dom's example there to the to its logical conclusion, which is you get your papers and in four weeks you, you are literally trying to hold the Russians back near Avdivka or near Kupiansk. Um, so that's a huge, huge issue. Uh, as it was put to me by another source, it was he said, look, if, if the war comes down to how big is your army, then Ukraine will lose because the West can provide weapons, artillery, munitions, tanks, planes, whatever. It cannot generate more Ukrainians to fight. So if that becomes the, the thing on which the war turns, it will go badly. And that's what my worry is. That's what we're starting to see. There's also a link between if the Russians are on the offensive, then Ukraine needs good defences. If you think that you, that Russia spent a lot of the time that when Ukraine was preparing for its counteroffensive, digging the Sorovkin line in the south, which which turned out to work incredibly well, the Ukrainians didn't get very far. The Russians dug deep and they dug well and they fought well. And the question, now the Russians are moving forward slowly, they're crawling forward, but they are, they've taken out Tivka, Kopiansk is being bombarded, um, Kharkiv, you know, is, is not too far away. The question now is on the defensive, 
does Ukraine have the defences available? Have they been using that time well? What do those defences look like? And I'm hearing questions about that from various people who are not full of, how to put it, who are worried about what the near future might hold. So those are all, as Dom said, those are all really important questions that need to be asked and uh, are unpopular questions, but they do need to be asked. But I'd like to finish just very quickly. You see a lot around Kiev and around Ukraine, of course, you see the billboards advertising recruitment, usually not always. It's the richer regiments advertising who, who can afford to advertise, right? So it's Azov, or it's one of the other sort of top brigades. And you also see some billboards to, to the fallen. And you see here in Kiev, there's many, many walls around the place showing the faces of people, their names, their regiment, where they fell from 2014 to now. And I think, obviously, you know, the society considers them defenders and heroes. There, there are other heroes, of course, as well. And I think when we met the teachers today, and you saw how much work they do just to keep the kids that are around them as much as they can on the straight and narrow to be the sort of fallback point if family problems become too much, to be the place that everybody in the community can go to if there's an airstrike, to have to develop their curriculum, to have to think about awful questions like how do you talk about the war? I mean, one of the, te- I think the head teacher told us, you know, what the, th- the question I get asked most by the kids is, when will this be over? And I asked her, well, what did you say? And she said, I'm just honest, I don't know. And the fact that they become kind of social worker, the parent, the teacher of last resort for so many people it is a huge burden. And it's, I think, such a difficult thing for people to take on against the background of increased family breakdown, increased sort of anxiety and mental health issues, an increase in the sort of militarization of young people, which, if you th- look at it another way, is inevitable. They are in, the Ukrainians are in, a, a, a an existential war. It's unsurprising that this should be the case. But I do think our contact who took us there and was translating and taking us around, Alla, who's a, an English teacher, you look at her, you don't necessarily think a hero, but I, after speaking to her and seeing what she's done for those kids and seeing, I mean, most of the conversations we had with the kids were completely normal. I, I felt odd being like, can you tell us about the last two years? How have you changed? Because they mainly wanted to speak about what kids like, whether it was gaming or learning dance or practicing their English or, or asking me questions. That's what they wanted to do. And I thought, my God, the strength of the people who've gotten to that point that they can go through two years of this, they can lose family members and still be enjoying something of a something of a childhood and something of teenagehood. It was hugely impressive. And we did start picking at some of the questions of is the government doing enough? Is the government doing enough to help? And we got suggestions that no, no not really, because it's all going to the army. But it was very, very interesting. And yeah, I just wanted to, I think it's always important to look at this from different angles. And teachers surely have to, teachers in Ukraine surely have to be some of the potentially unsung heroes of the last two years, of everything they've had to do and support their kids and for everything they, so yeah, thank you very much, Ala, for showing us round. And thank you to Olga, the head teacher, for, for all of her time. And we got a huge amount of time with her, which was really well spent. And thank you, you know, Vladik, Dasha and Yana for interviewing me for their podcast. So when that's out, we'll definitely link to that. And you can hear them really put me on the spot. Coming up, Dominic has an exclusive interview with Ukraine's military spy chief, Lieutenant General Kirillo Budanov. Earlier today, Dominic Nichols spoke to Lieutenant General Kirillo Budanov, the head of the HUR, Ukraine's military intelligence agency, who says Western nations are providing priceless intelligence support by locating the launch sites of Russian missiles fired at Ukraine. General Budanov, we know you're a very busy man. You've got a lot on and uh, you don't have much time in your day to, to come and speak to people. So we do thank you very much indeed. Speaking about how busy you are and how you how you rest your brain, other than learning about burning Russian warships. When was the last time you read for pleasure? It's an interesting question. You were right to say I work a lot, but I'm still human, so sometimes I also need to sleep. If you want to know about my schedule, my sleep is very much interrupted. Often things happen and I have to answer calls. All of us have this problem of not having enough sleep. Everyone who has been defending Ukraine for many years. And I think we will have this problem until the end of the war. And until then, it cannot be resolved. It's not just about the sleep. It's more about the mental rest. It's impossible to put aside what is happening right now. Of course, you're, you're, you're only human, you're a man, you're a husband, you have um, responsibilities elsewhere. Um, if I may ask, how is your wife after the, the attack? 
Thank you for asking this question. She's a little better now. You said in an interview, I think last week or the week before, that uh, that you know how that attack happened and there would be suitable retribution. I can't remember the exact phrase. Um, what did you mean by that? Don't be hasty. These kinds of things need some time to be resolved. In time, everybody will see what that means. So in the British military, our intelligence cycle is direct, collect, process and disseminate. About how you, how you use intelligence, how you seek and turn information into intelligence. I imagine you have a similar process in Ukrainian military intelligence. I'd be interested in how your, um, how your resources have had to shift across those disciplines in the last two years. You're asking me a question that relates to information that is classified. But at the same time, I'll try to give you a general idea. Since the start of the war, we have increased our staff significantly. The following branches increased in numbers the most. Combat, operational and technical intelligence units. Again, I can highlight that cyber intelligence was significantly expanded. It's obvious that after the amount of intelligence data increased, the question of how to process and analyse it arose. Another branch to be expanded was the analytical one and new innovations on technical data processing, based on artificial intelligence and so on. Basically all of it is connected to the technical side of intelligence. When it comes to the dissemination of intelligence data, nothing has changed. It's clear that the country's leadership started to require much more military data from us. That's to say the enemy's intentions, their current status and their strategic plans, etc. On the analytical side, as you describe there, which, is, which has got bigger, the requirement, the need for more analysis, how much have you been able to uh, rely on or outsource to external supporters, so, so other intelligence agencies from other countries? We don't shift our responsibilities and duties onto anyone, and if someone tried doing that, I would definitely forbid it. At the same time, we are using intelligence provided by our partners extensively. But it doesn't in any way substitute the work that we do. It just adds to the intelligence that we then decide how to use. It's often critically important for us to receive information about the missiles launched from the areas that we cannot cover with our means of signals intelligence coverage or electronic intelligence coverage. This kind of help is just priceless for us. If I could ask about that area, please, the um, irregular warfare or partisan warfare in occupied territories and inside Russia itself, do you have, are you able to direct those kind of activities or do you take what you're given, basically? Do you, how much control do you have over that, that level of action? I think this is a clear enough answer. In certain situations, we're in control of the situation, whereas sometimes we exploit the opportunities that have emerged. I wouldn't describe it as partisan movements. That is something very different from what is actually happening. Mostly, it's the traditional work of intelligence agencies. It's clear that during the war, intelligence is responsible not only for gathering data, but also conducting special operations. Working with big groups of people, or you can call them partisans, is just a small part of our activities. Unfortunately, there are not that many such groups in Russia. We help them, support them and interact with them. Sometimes we ask them to perform some tasks. But this cooperation is not as extensive as it may seem. Friends of mine in, in the British intelligence uh, community, including military intelligence human world, uh, over the last few years felt a little, a little unloved. SIGINT was, was everything in cyber. Do you think your experience over the last few years has really shown that the, the relative priority of human has been um, underappreciated in recent years? Mostly what we do is the traditional work of an intelligence agency. You should understand that had we relied only on signals intelligence, electronic intelligence and cyber data, we wouldn't have been ready for the invasion and wouldn't have been able to prepare for it. 
we'll talk about this. Looking the other way round, what is the insider threat today in Ukraine? And what is the threat from GRU and other agencies to the supply lines coming in from Poland and elsewhere bringing arms ammunition into Ukraine? We are quite aware of the plans for We know for sure that Russia planned to destabilize and disrupt the system of military supplies from the West. The plans were developed and existed. Some information was acquired by the intelligence agency. They developed plans, it's normal. As far as we know, they tried to implement them several times, but it was all in vain. Let me stress it once again. Had a political decision been made to set that in motion, they already had everything they needed to do that. Whether this will be successful or not, I think the answer is no, since special agencies from Western countries are actively working as well, making it hard for Russians to implement those plans. Do you think the assistance that's given to you from, from outside is, is sufficient to track the, the, the actions of GRU and others? Or is this an area of big concern? We've got enough resources of our own. We need help mostly on strategic issues. General Gerasimov must have several significant personal qualities, and one of them is his strategic endurance, which is of great importance here. Talking about the, the conventional battle inside Ukraine now, do you think we have underestimated General Gerasimov? He is a great survivor. He is still there despite many setbacks. I wonder if, if we've How do you assess his, his actions and, and is, he, is he secure in his position? You were right to say he nearly lost his job several times, but he's always managed to find a way out of the situation. I can state that we don't see anyone among Russia's generals who could replace him, for now. He's one of the few who can force the other generals to do their job. I think this is where his power and irreplaceability are. Are you winning the intelligence war? It will be possible to answer this question of who won when the war is over. Or put it put another way, I again remember that if, ever, if anything didn't go entirely to plan, the, um, the operations boys, the J3 Skywalkers, would always say the intelligence failed us. Do you feel that that was the impression left after the counteroffensive last year? As you mentioned, you often hear people saying that the responsibility for some of their failures or miscalculations is somebody else's, and our agency is not an exception. The ability to acknowledge one's own mistakes is a rather distinctive and high-valued quality of a leader. Looking to the next, the next year or the next six months, do you feel you have enough um, knowledge about what's happening down in Zaporizhia region, across the, across the Dnipro? Are you still gaining enough in intelligence value from the forces you have there to warrant their, their positional holding? They haven't moved for months and they are there at, at some cost. Are you still, is it still worth keeping the people in that, in that area? We've got enough information. The question of what to do with the armed forces should be asked not to me, but to the general staff of the armed forces. Could I ask you a little bit about the, my phrase, the ambushes, the air and maritime ambushes that have happened recently? You've sunk a lot of Russian ships, you've shot down a lot of Russian planes, and it sounds as if this was not just that, that they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, but that you have innovated and put at risk some very technical assets to strike those Russian forces. Am I reading that situation correct? What kind of highly technological systems do you mean? For example, you seem to know when it is safe to push HIMARS as far forward as it can go so it can use its maximum range to hit Russian ships. That can't happen by accident. I can't recall a situation when a HIMARS missile was used to target a Russian ship recently. Look, you mean something different. You asked about HIMARS and you got a direct response. 
Fine. So, so these are these are lucky strikes. The Russian jets are are just are just being are succumbing to to air defence. It's not as if there's you've seen the through your uh, measurement and signatures intelligence, for example, how they are operating and where you might be able to mass forces. Regarding fighter jets, they are a trap for air defence systems, and it's clear for any knowledgeable expert. It's a classic manoeuvre from every handbook all over the world. Just finally, General Badanov, you have a canary in a cage in your in your outer office. The canary in the coal mine always always uh, warns of impending danger. Each morning, what is the canary that you look for in the overnight intelligence summary that tells you if it's going to be a very bad day? It's a metaphor. It's an interesting metaphor. I'm more prosaic about it. I clearly know what to pay attention to and what to ignore in situations where the data hasn't changed. Moreover, I've got a huge team who would draw my attention to things I omitted. And finally, are we missing anything? The Western media, we love looking at glitzy missiles and explosions in the Black Sea. Are we missing something that you think we should be looking at more? I think you are paying enough attention to this war. Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to Ukraine, the latest. Your support and attention means so much to all of us. And just in case you didn't know, The Telegraph runs another podcast you may be interested in. Battle Lines is our weekly global affairs and defence podcast where we look at conflicts and unrest around the world with The Telegraph's sterling foreign desk. On Battle Lines, you'll hear updates and news on everything from the violence in the Middle East and the Red Sea, civil wars in Sudan and Myanmar, to unrest in Ecuador. Join myself, Roland Oliphant, Sophia Yan and Natalia Vasilieva on Battle Lines, published every Friday. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To support our work and to stay on top of all our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, please subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at telegraph.co.uk forward stroke Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Giles Gear, Georgia Cohn and Rachel Porter. Executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells. Can we do the shush? Can we do the shush? No. <laughs>